Hello, I'm Ed Fuquay, young adult librarian extraordinaire here at Woonsocket Terrace Public Library. Volunteer at Frisbee's in the children's room. And we're having another conversation. We're continuing our talk about world mythology. We're moving on now to India, the, the massive subcontinent, which is the home of uh, Hindu mythology. All right. The, uh, the Hindu mythology, uh, it's a lot of exciting things about it. All right, first of all, um, Unlike a lot of the religions I've been talking about, Hinduism is still being practiced by a lot of people. Okay. Uh, it is the third uh, most practiced religion in the world, mm -hmm. Hinduism. Um, there are apparently uh, roughly 900 million practitioners and over a million in the United States alone. So this is an opportunity, if I mispronounce too many names or get these stories completely wrong, to insult the, the beliefs of hundreds of millions of people. So, it's a scary prospect. It's very exciting, yes. <laughs> uh, I'll repeat my mantra that I am a storyteller. As an atheist, I approach all religions in the exact same way from the storytelling standpoint. Okay. Um, so the Hindu pantheon is also, uh, like every ancient religion we've studied, um, it's changed a lot over the years. There's several different versions of it. Um, many different languages are spoken in India. So, you ha so characters all have like different names and the same stories are told about different gods, and you know, so it's kind of a mishmash of things. Um, there's, there's been some continuity over the years, though. Um, it's roughly 3,000 years old. The oldest religious text that inspired Hinduism is about 3,000 years old. So it's definitely right up there with being ancient you know, mythology. What text is that? Uh, the Upanishads. They're thousands of pages long, and I've never read them, so. I've never heard of them. Yeah, Upanishads, they're out there. Um, the, uh, there's a traditional creation story, like almost every pantheon has, of Dyes the Sky and Prithvu, the Earth, get together and produce a whole pantheon of gods, almost exactly like we've heard from other pantheons. Um, in the old days, the first great god of the Hindu religion was Indra. Uh, Indra was a god of war and a storm god. Uh, he rode on a lightning bolt. Um, he could bring rain and, um, he would attack monsters and kill them with his magic thunderbolt. So he was very much like an Odin, um, uh, rather Thor and Zeus kind of character. Um, his most famous battle was defeating a giant snake, um, or sometimes dragon, uh, called Ritra. And Ritra had like sucked up all the waters of the world, leaving a massive drought. And so when he killed Ritra, he split him open with a thunderbolt and all the waters gushed out, forming the oceans and the rivers that still flow to this very day. That's interesting. That's like opposite of the flood story. Yeah, kind of. Um, there's a version of the story in which he actually takes the monster's like body and makes him into like the sun and the moon and things like that, which again we've seen in several other pantheons. Mm -hmm. um, but as time went by, um, he was taken less and less seriously as a god. He became kind of a comic figure who hung around other people's mythologies and didn't really like you know, do anything accomplished after that. Um, the Upanishads gave us the concept of Brahma. A Brahma is in some ways um, all things. A Brahma is uh, the essence of all creation. So it can be argued, and scholars have, that Hinduism is actually a kind of monotheism mm -hmm. in the sense that Brahma is all things. Yes, there are gods, but all gods are Brahma. Mm -hmm. The same way the earth is Brahma. Yeah. Um, so, uh, however, the actual way, okay, the same also, this technique also became the result of what led to the caste system in India, where people were organized by the different castes that they're born into, and that's their social strata they can't get out of. And the top of the caste system is known as Brahmins, because they're considered the closest to God. Yeah. Um, however, the way it's actually worshipped in practice is, um, it eventually wound up being a trinity of gods. So there's three gods who are at the top of the Hindu pantheon. That's Brahma, who's called the creator god, and Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. So together, these represent that kind of cosmic balance. Brahma creates all things, and then Vishnu is the one that makes everything work and function. He's the god of order and justice, and Shiva is the destroyer. So when it's time to turn out the lights and everybody goes home, it's Shiva who will come in and destroy the universe. Um, and they believe in a cyclical thing, that this has happened before and will happen again. This is not, this is not the first universe, it's one of many. Mm -hmm. um, and so eventually Shiva will destroy the world and Brahma will in turn create another one. Much the same way they believe in reincarnation of human souls, 
that you die in one body and then you're reborn later in a different body. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens to the entire universe, all of reality. Okay. A lot of it is poetry, a lot of it is philosophy, much of which is lost in a Western European educated audience like me. Um, so we met Brahma, uh, Vishnu the preserver, um, is, uh, he represents order. He has uh, four arms and blue skin. Um, he's married to Lakshmi, the goddess of prosperity. Uh, so he's very well off. Um, the Hindu gods tend to have a lot of arms and sometimes a lot of heads, uh, which became a device in, in Indian art to show how powerful they were. Um, that, like for instance, Brahma, because he created the whole world, um, has four heads, one facing in each different direction, so we can see north, south, east, and west all at the same time. So is this purely symbolic to uh, the believers, or do they believe that, physically speaking, he would have four heads? I believe it's symbolic, but the difference between symbolism um, and reality is kind of fuzzy in a lot of things with the Hindu gods. Okay. Um, I think it's meant to represent artistically the way it works. Okay. Um, like there's a goddess of mercy who, because she wants to reach out a helping hand to everyone in the world, is drawn with like a thousand hands coming out of her back. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure it's meant to be symbolic. What is the symbolism of him being blue? Um, that I'm not sure about. There's several different versions of it. Uh, there's one in which she was fighting a giant snake and drank the snake's poison and it turned his skin blue. But several other um, Hindu gods also became blue at the same time. So it goes back and forth. Um, now, the interesting thing about Vishnu is he has a lot of avatars. Are you familiar with that concept? Like the show? No. That's the thing. That's the, that's the problem. The word has been used in a lot of different contexts. Avatars like we make on Xbox? Uh, similar. Okay. Okay, here's the thing. Avatars in Hindu mythology represent a different form of the god. And this is where it gets kind of tricky for a, a like I said, a Western audience. Um, for the most part, we'd like to believe in like a binary, left or right, white or black. It's, it's you know, everything should be set down solidly so you can discuss it properly. But in Hindu mythology, they don't care about that. So a god has an avatar and he uses that avatar to accomplish things in the world. The avatar both is the god and is his own person. The avatar can have an entirely different personality, an entirely different range of powers, and it's not like a puppet you walk around in, not like, you know, they use the word avatar for um, you know, the science fiction movie where there are like eight foot tall blue aliens. Um, but it's not like a meat puppet you walk around in. The, your, the god's avatar is a completely unique individual. Is there just the one avatar or are there many? Vishnu had a lot of them, more than can really be counted. There's over a hundred I found in, in one of the pages on the internet. His most famous avatars are Krishna and Buddha who are themselves gods in their own right. Um, Krishna worship is an entirely separate branch of Hinduism. Um, that's where they have Krishnas and Krishna consciousness comes from. Um, technically, Krishna is just an avatar of Vishnu, but they also believe that Buddha was an avatar of Vishnu, that Vishnu reincarnated himself on earth as Buddha to bring Buddhism to the world. Hmm. I'm not sure if Buddhists believe that or not, I'd have to ask one. Um, but that's definitely a part of Vishnu's storyline. Um, there's a theory that he comes to Earth every time the Earth needs something, like when there was a massive flood, he came to Earth as a like giant fish. And there are statues of him with like his top, because his top torso is like a four-armed guy, and his whole bottom torso is like a fish. Um, and that was when he came to protect the Earth when there was a massive flood. So and the, th the theory is that he's come to us so many times, if he has to come one more time, he'll arrive riding a, riding a white horse, and that'll be the last time he saves the world, and after that, everything will be destroyed. That's parallel to Christianity. Yeah. Interesting. Well, it's interesting. When I first studied the avatars, I had a hard time wrapping my head around it. Um, and one of the things is, um, that uh, the only way I could think about it is like Christianity. Jesus came to earth and he both is Jesus, the son of God, and he's God mm -hmm. at the same time. Right. Um, again, being an atheist, I don't fully understand that concept, but in a much the same way that um, Vishnu is um, 
Buddha and is not Buddha simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, now, the more interesting one of the Trinity is Shiva the Destroyer, okay. as you can imagine from his name. Uh, he's a god of destruction, um, but he's also lord of the deaths, like, like Michael Flaherty. But he does not do Irish step dancing. If he did, it would probably be very bad because they believe the universe is both created and destroyed by dancing. And that everything in the universe is involved in a cosmic cycle of creation and destruction, an, an eternal dance, if you will. Okay, are, are, again, are we just rolling with symbolism here or are we literally talking dance? I don't know, they, Shiva at the end will dance the universe away. A lot of the images of Shiva have him in the middle of like a you know one of those complicated dances like you see in the Bollywood movies. Okay. Um, hmm. Yeah, they're into a, yeah creation destruction are believed to be philosophically linked that you can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. So just because he's the destroyer doesn't mean that he's bad. He's right. not evil. He's just the destroyer. Yeah. Um, he's married to uh, Parvati, who is the goddess of love. She's the stunningly beautiful, she's the goddess of love, beauty, fertility, flowers, everything nice and beautiful. But um, her main avatar is Durga, the war goddess. So maybe being a wife of the god of destruction, she has, her other self is a war goddess. Uh, Durga has like 10 arms, the weapon each arm. She wades into the battlefield and starts chopping off heads and limbs and body parts just go flying when she's at work. Um, yeah, pretty impressive. Is there a male version of her? Um, not really. She's a war goddess, and she's uh, she represents a lot. Uh, she's but she's also a fertility goddess and a goddess of motherhood. Okay. Um, now, uh, she and um, and Shiva are married, and they're the parents of Ganesha who is one of the most famous of the, uh, the Hindu gods. If you've ever seen an image of a, a Hindu god with a big elephant head, yeah, long okay. trunk, yep. yep, that's Ganesha. Ganesha is the most popular Hindu god. He's kind of worshiped all over the world because he's so famous. Yep. He's kind of cute looking. Um, people just love him. He doesn't really have a bad side. I guess you can get on his bad side if you try really hard. Um, he has a fascinating backstory, right? So, um, Shiva was off on one of his uh, periodic uh, going out and destroying an army of demons missions, you know, to protect the earth, he does that. And while he was gone, um, Parvati gave birth to Ganesha. In some, she created, she generated him spontaneously. Um, and in some of them, she was just pregnant when, when he left. Or maybe there was a cloth that washed ashore. That's possible, there could have been a cloth. There's at least two different versions of where he comes from. Um, so, um, so basically, when he was born, he looked perfectly normal. Okay. He's a normal little kid, but of course, he was a god. So he was already extremely powerful and extremely ac accomplished warrior and things like that. So, uh, despite his, his tender age, um, she sent him to guard her palace while she went in and bathed. Um, and what should happen, um, but Shiva comes back from his mission mm -hmm. and doesn't recognize this kid. And okay. Ganesha, refuses an entry into the bath chamber. He wants to join his wife, and there's no way Ganesha is letting him in. So Shiva grows a little enraged and winds up cutting off the kid's head. So he marches into the, the bathroom with, you know, a dripping red blade, and Parvati gets out of the bath and sees her newborn son beheaded and really gets angry. Um, he says, bring my son back to life or I'll be incarnate as Durga and destroy everything. So he knows, you know, he sees the writing on the wall here. Do they have the means to do so? Yes, fortunately. Oh. Um, he can preserve life because he's the god of, you know, maintaining the status quo. So he runs out and has either he or his servants find the first already dead animal they can locate, which happens to be an elephant. So he comes back and attaches the elephant head and brings his son back to life. Because the original head was lost, it couldn't be used. Um, so that was how Ganesha became the elephant-headed Hindu god. Um, and he went on to become a very famous god. In fact, no matter which Hindu god you favor in your personal like worship, everybody reveres Ganesha. So as soon as you mentioned the elephant, I, I was with you. Um, and I think I've 
really only ever seen that aspect of it. So you're saying that from the neck down, we're looking he's at usually human. human. Although not always, the art is fuzzy a little sometimes. Okay. Sometimes he's an anthropomorphized elephant, kind of like a furry. Um, interestingly, if, if, you are, if you are familiar with the elephant man, uh, Joseph Merrick from uh, Victorian England. Mm, vaguely. He was someone who had a disease that left him horribly deformed. Okay. And uh, he was rescued from an asylum he was in by a doctor who tried to take care of him, although there was no cure for his condition. But his head was grotesquely misshapen. And he made the comment to Merrick that if you were in India, you'd probably be worshipped as a god because you looked like Ganesha, the elephant-headed god. Wow. And so he became nicknamed the Elephant Man. Wow. And the film about his life is called The Elephant Man. There's no actual connection to Ganesha, but it's an interesting little, like, you know, tidbit. Um, Ganesha is the remover of obstacles. He's the god of good fortune and wealth, so you definitely want to be on his good side. He's the lord of new beginnings. So anytime you start something, um, when you begin when you begin a journey, you make a little prayer to Ganesha, do a little thing at his shrine. When you start filming a new movie, when you start a new relationship, you say a little thing for Ganesha to give you good luck to see how it works out. Um, he's a Hindu god. He rides in a giant mouse, which I think is done for irony purposes. <laughs> Um, because mice, because traditionally elephants are afraid of mice, right. which Mythbusters prove that's a fact. Elephants are afraid of mice. So he rides in the back of a giant mouse. Mm -hmm. There you go. He's often depicted that way in the art. Um, he is also, um, he has one broken tusk is one of his features. Mm -hmm. um, the story is that a elderly sage was telling him like the greatest story in the world, which became the Mahabharata which is a, the longest epic poem ever written. And so Ganesha was copying it down so it wouldn't be lost. In the middle of it, his pen broke. So he had no choice, being a d writer that he was, he broke his own tusk in half and dipped that in the inkwell and wrote the rest of the 100,000 page Mahabharata with his own tusk. <laughs> nice. Yeah, quite a guy. He was also the Hindu trickster god on top of all this other stuff. Uh, he would frequently do like things to teach people a lesson. Many of the stories about Ganesha interfering with people's lives always have as an important lesson that you need to learn. Um, there's one in which he shows up at a guy's house and the guy says, oh, it's, it's a god, I have to take care of him. And so he immediately starts like giving him food and Ganesha keeps eating and eating and eats him like out of house and home. And so, um, so he immediately runs out and spends more money buying more and better food to feed Ganesha until finally he likes he's gonna be broke. And so finally he prays um, uh, to, uh, to Shiva to help him. Mm -hmm. And so Shiva shows up and says, I know what to do. And he hands a bowl of oats, which Ganesha eats in a satisfied way. And um, so I said, well, why did the oats satisfy him and nothing else? And I said, well, if you hadn't been trying to impress him with your wealth, he probably would have been easily satisfied. Gotcha. Yeah. There's also one in which um, their father was going to give Ganesha and his, and his uh, brother as a prize, but only one of them, so one of them has to, to win the prize. And so they have a contest to see who can race around the world three times the fastest, them all being gods and everything. So his brother takes off at super speeds and starts zipping around the earth, and Ganesha just stands there for a while, then at the last minute he runs around his mother and his father three times. And they say, what are you doing? He says, well, you are the whole world to me. Yeah. <laughs> so sucker that he is, he falls for this and gives the prize to Ganesha. <laughs> nice. So as a trickster god, he's a lot more benign than a lot of them we're going to encounter. Um, but I haven't gotten to the coolest Hindu god yet. Okay. Oh yeah, it gets better. Um, if you like Durga, you're going to love Kali. All right. Uh, Kali is uh, the Hindu goddess of death and destruction. Um, this is her origin. It's really great. Durga uh, was fighting a war, I think against the buffalo demon, because buffalo demons were a real problem in ancient India, apparently. They crop up periodically. So she's fighting a war and she gets really super angry. She gets so angry. Don't you hate it when like your anger bursts out of your forehead and becomes an entirely new goddess? <laughs> I hate it when that happens. <laughs> so Durga, who is, mind you, already a goddess of war, created her bad side broke out of her brain <laughs> and became Kali. Uh, Kali is basically like death personified. Um, Durga was a war goddess. She represented war. Kali represents death and destruction. Um, however, she's not evil. She's not an evil goddess at all. Right. 
Um, they say she represents Shakti, which is pure, un, pure raw feminine energy. Mm -hmm. So she's both a creator and destroyer. She causes destruction and fertility simultaneously. Um, if you've seen depictions of her, and they're all over the internet and the rest of the world, she generally has black or deep blue skin. Um, she has six arms, frequently a weapon in each arm. Um, when she has four arms, she has one arm holding a severed head, and the arm below that is holding a bowl catching the blood from the severed head, and one arm is brandishing a weapon, and one arm is, is making a beneficent gesture of blessing towards you. But she represents both life and death simultaneously. What's the significance of catching the blood? Okay, there's a whole story about that. Um, she was fighting um, Raktabija, or Raktabisha. I want to pronounce it with a soft J, although I'm not sure they do in, in, in India. Um, so Raktabisha Raka was a demon who was really impossible to defeat. Several gods attacked him. And the problem with him was when you attacked him, if you cut him, his blood fell to the ground, and each drop of blood became a new demon. Ah. So the more you fought him, the more you increased his numbers. And things are getting really badly out of hand. So, um, so Callie steps in. Mm -hmm. She's like, no problem, I will take care of this. So, there's several different versions of how she does it. Um, in one of them, she attacks him and decapitates him, and then drinks the blood before it can strike the ground. So she gobbles up all his blood. Um, the other two versions are she either like eats him alive by becoming a giant and just like pops him down. Um, another version of which she strangles him, thereby killing him without spilling any blood. Gotcha. Um, but ultimately, the thing is, the blood can't hit the ground. So the bull represents her catching the blood from the demon that she just killed. Okay. Um, the, the myth about killing by strangulation led to the creation of the Thuggies, a cult of assassins who would kill people by strangulation. Um, they were supposedly a severe threat to people in the 1800s in India. They killed a lot of people. However, now people believe that's mostly a colonial myth. There undoubtedly were worshippers of Kali who didn't like the British rule in India. A lot of Indians didn't like the British rule in India. Right. And some of them undoubtedly did murder people. But as to being an active cult of hundreds of, of people working secretly to you know, destroy British rule, probably didn't happen the way the British said that it did. That doesn't stop Kali from being the go-to villainous for anyone who's writing a mediocre story set in old India. The British said yeah. that this occurred. The British said there was a massive cult of murderers out there who were attacking people and killing them by strangulation, and each death was a sacrifice to Kelly. Was there some benefit to them spreading a potentially false rumor of um, that nature? It gave them excuse to bring in soldiers and troops to, uh, to, to occupy certain areas to pacify them. Okay. They, they spent a lot of bullets wiping out this Kelly cult that modern historians say may not have existed. Um, you may also remember Kali um, was also the goddess that the villains worshipped in Indiana Jones, the Temple of Doom. The Temple of Doom was a temple to Kali. Mm. Yeah. And they would pray to Kali as they cut people's hearts out. Yeah. Yeah. That famous scene. Um, so, yeah, so she became, she was also um, uh, briefly on Xena Warrior Princess. Uh, she was reincarnated as Kali for an extended sequence that was set in old India. So, um, so Kali is basically one of the goddesses that's extremely popular. Um, she represents, you know, so many different things. Um, in some version of the story, she has earrings that are made of unborn embryos because she's also protector of children and babies. And so that symbolizes her protective nature. Um, as I said, she represents like raw, untamed female energy, which a lot of like modern practitioners, modern pagans or Wiccans or things like that, see that as being mostly a positive thing. Yeah. And again, she was not evil. Um, you would call on Kali if you, if you were trying to like overcome alcoholism. Mm -hmm. You could do a prayer to Kali to destroy your alcoholism, just obliterate it with her six arms, with daggers in each arm. Um, <laughs> It's a symbol of power that you called upon when you really needed it to destroy anything in your path that you couldn't get rid of any other way. 
Um, she is definitely still worshipped and still called upon. So did calling upon such gods create some kind of obligation to them? Usually not. Um, they would perform things without necessarily any obligation. You were usually expected to do something at their temple, which was the theory behind the ritual murders. But as to how often those occurred, no one really knows. Hmm. So those are the most famous gods from the Hindu pantheon. So there to, are hundreds of gods. To clarify. Yes. Your answer is no, you're not necessarily obligated except for the occasional murder. Right. Well, like in Greece, if you wanted to stay on like Zeus's good side, you always had to make regular offerings at the temple. Um, the Hindu gods had temples, most of them, and they readily accepted offerings of various things. Um, but there wasn't so much they will hunt you down if you forget to make a sacrifice, like the Greek gods sometimes did. Um, so Kali's worship usually, usually doesn't involve a quid pro quid kind of thing, where you have to do something for her. Um, she was too powerful to actually want anything from mortals, I, I believe. Okay. Just reading between the lines of her legend. Um, one of the coolest things about her was when she first went on a rampage, she had a hard time stopping herself, um, which is the exact same myth that we saw in ancient Egypt with Sekhmet, right. who also was an out of control goddess of destruction. Um, and the only way that Kali was finally stopped was that Shiva uh, threw himself to the ground in front of her and she wound up stepping on him. And the act of stepping on um, Shiva reminded her of what she was doing and she kind of snapped out of it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so she's also the goddess of realizing you've gone too far and correcting your mistakes. <laughs> Very relatable. But she's also someone you qualified, yeah, when you have to change what you're doing to improve yourself. Um, and in some of the stories, um, Shiva has this blissful smile on his face because by submitting to the, the Shakti, the female energy, he's reached a higher plane. So almost most depictions of Kali have her standing on Shiva because that's such an important part of her myth. So those are the biggies in Hindu mythology. Uh, I want to talk more about some of them next week, um, including um, one of the many avatars of Vishnu is Rama. And he is a star of the Ramayana, which is the sort of the Hindu version of the Odyssey. Um, it's a really cool story, which I'll be telling next week. All right, okay. How does it sound to you, Aiden? Intrigued, because I was wondering if like all of the ones that we've gone through previously, I was going to experience, uh, oh yeah, you did know that from yeah. such and such. And, um, you know, some of it is familiar, mm -hmm. but largely new information. So. It's the third largest religion in the world, but it really hasn't penetrated America all that much, despite having more than a million practitioners um, in America. Uh, and I, I think because it's much like Buddhism, it's as much a philosophy as a religion. Mm -hmm. And um, so because of that, they're not bothered by some of the contradictions that our like, Western European minds want to have explained. Right. They're willing to keep as a mystery. Yeah. You know, um, is Parvati Durga or is she not? The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just roll with it. But I like the line in which she threatens to become Durga, to kill somebody, which I thought was a really funny line, so I had to throw that in there. <laughs> um, all right, so we'll talk more next week when we reach the Ramayana. Until then, I have been Ed. Solitaire. We'll see you next time. Until then, be safe.